live your truth. That may be true for you, but that's not true for me. It's no secret that we live in an age of incredible confusion about truth. In fact, we've heard about fake news with artificial intelligence come along. Let me tell you something. We haven't heard anything yet. We as believers must be more committed to truth than ever. So let me start with the verse I know you're familiar with where Jesus makes it clear that truth matters. In John 14, 6, he says, I am one of the ways, one of the truths, and one possible life. If you want to come to father or mother through me, that's cool. Go forth living according to whatever feels good to you. Jesus didn't say that, did he? In fact, you know there's at least a hundred verses in the New Testament that either directly or indirectly make the claim that Jesus is the only way to get to God. Jesus seemed to think that truth and what we believe about it is pretty important. So have you ever just stopped and thought, why does truth really matter? Why should I seek it? Why should I sacrifice for it? Who cares about truth? I was given a talk similar to this years ago, and as soon as I was done, I walked down stage, and this young man came walking up to me. He goes, Dr. McDowell, you just talked for an hour about truth. Why is truth even important? I said, well, do you want the true answer or the false answer? <laughs> Friends, we live in an age where there are certain obvious things that we know, but they've been pushed like a beach ball underwater. And part of our job is to bring to the surface certain things that people know because they're human and live in God's world and are made in God's image, like truth being important. But let's clarify it for our own confidence. Why does truth even matter? I think there's three reasons why truth matters so much. Number one, truth has consequences. Truth has consequences. My uncle is a retired pastor from Massachusetts, and he told me a story years ago about a distant cousin of mine that I never had a chance to meet. This cousin, he was deaf, and he would go walking on the train tracks out near where he lived at the same time every single day. So he woke up one morning believing he was safe, thinking his beliefs matched up with reality, but it never occurred to him that they would change the time that the train came. So walking there, thinking his beliefs would lead to safety, they switched the times. The train came, he couldn't hear the warning, couldn't stop in in time, and actually struck and killed my cousin, largely because he had false information. Friends, truth has consequences. Now, that's obviously a dramatic example, but I read a story not long ago about some teenagers who were driving through an intersection, didn't see a stop sign, and thought they could go, ran through it, and T-boned somebody. How many of you ever just stopped and thought, how many decisions day by day you make based on what you think is true? Okay, when is that conference? Where is that conference? My moment by moment, we're making decisions based on what we think is true. And when we get it wrong, there's consequences. This is in part why Hosea, the minor prophet, said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you don't have truth in your finances, you'll wreck your finances. You don't have truth in a relationship, you'll wreck a relationship. In fact, if our country keeps suppressing truth, it's going to wreck our country and certainly our spiritual lives. Now, there's a second reason why truth is important. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes where you're at. Close your eyes. Now, with your eyes closed, point the direction you think is north. Keep your eyes closed. You got to go on a journey. Point the direction you think is north. Now, keep your hands pointed, open up your eyes, and look around. This group right here has somebody pointing at least every single direction. Now, I am severely directionally challenged, but I can tell you one thing. Despite how some of you pointed, north is not straight up. (laughs) (laughs) Now, if you're trying to get to, say, Georgia, and you're confused about the direction of north, you're going to get lost. But what might you have that will help you figure out what direction is north? A compass or the app on your smartphone, right? Interestingly enough, what compasses do is they tell us 
true north, and then we know how to orient our lives once we have correct information. You see, truth is a compass for life. Truth not only keeps us from consequences, but it helps direct us positively what choices and what direction we should go. A number of years ago, somebody really important in my life, something happened to him. I don't want to mention who it was because I'd never want to embarrass the woman who birthed me. (laughs) Now, my mom has given me permission to share this story, but a few years ago, she got a new email account and decided to set it up herself. And one of the first instructions that came up on the screen said, close all the windows. (laughs) My mom, my own flesh and blood, literally got up from her chair walked around the house and closed all the windows in the house. You're laughing and chuckling either because you get the joke or you've done it too, let's be honest. You know, you see, you know a computer has been designed by somebody very smart to function a certain way, right? But when we're confused about the design and truth of a computer, what happens? Embarrassment, frustration, and let's face it, sometimes anger. If something has been designed, there's a purpose for it, and there's a truth built into it. And we have to understand that purpose to know how we should use it. You know, it's really interesting to me. The first thing we learn about God in the Bible is not that God is holy, not that God is love or just, but in the beginning, God created The first thing we're explicitly told about God is that God is a creator. Why? First off, you and I are not an accident, but this is a purposeful world that God has made. Like a computer, but to the nth degree, we're only free when we understand that purpose, discover that truth, and then live according to it. That's in part why Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Lies bring slavery. It's truth that brings freedom. I think one of the biggest lies facing all of us, in particular the next generation, is about freedom. That freedom is doing whatever you want without restraint. Friends, that's not freedom. Real freedom is orienting our lives around reality. Real freedom is understanding God's design, truth built into the world, and then living according to it. That's why truth is matters. It was G.K. Chesterton who said, look, you can free a camel from the zoo, but don't free it from its hump. Having a hump is in part what it means to be a camel. We got to discover what something is first, and then we know how it should live and how it should operate. That's why truth matters. If there is a God who has made us, we are only free when we know that truth and we are in our lives to his truth. That's why truth is like a comes for life. Now, there's a third reason why truth matters, and it's because believing is not enough. What do you mean believing is not enough? Nothing is true because you believe it. Don't believe me? You know how many times I believed I was six foot ten and in the NBA? I'm only six eight. On this stage. I believe there's a million dollars in my wallet. It doesn't matter how much I believe that. It's not there. By the way, even if it were there, my great state of California would take most of it anyways. (laughs) Reality is disgustingly indifferent to what we believe about it. Nothing is true because we believe. By the way, you can have your own beliefs, but you cannot have your own truth. You can have your own beliefs, but you cannot have your own truth because nothing is true simply because we believe it. Now, one thing we actually haven't done yet is define the word truth. I actually spent a lot of time with my students helping them define words. What is love? Everybody's talking about justice today, but few people can actually give me an intelligent definition of justice. Well, what is truth? What is truth? I'm going to give you a simple definition, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. It's what's called the correspondence theory of truth. A statement is true if it matches up with reality. Or a belief is true 
if it corresponds to reality. So for truth, you have a belief, you have reality, and if there's a correspondence between them, then your belief is true. And if it's not, your belief is false. So if I told you I drove here from Southern California where I live, and it only took me 14 hours because I drove in my new red Lamborghini. And you go walking outside the parking lot and you see this, my statement just might be what? Okay, just humor me. My statement might be true. Now, if you walk outside and you see this, my statement would be what? It'd be false. Why? Because I said it's red, in reality it's yellow. If you walk outside and see the kind of car I actually drive, which is this, why are you laughing? I gave this talk not long ago to a junior higher, an eighth grader goes, ha, 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 you drive a Ford. I was like, what do you drive? <laughs> My statement would be really false because that's not even close to a Lamborghini. If you haven't noticed by looking at my computer screen, I like, and my shirt, I like superheroes. And so sometimes I'll use objects to try to teach my kids basic truths. So I've taken my kids and said, look, here's an object or the image, and here's a word. When you have a correspondence, that's Wolverine, that's Batman, that's Spider-Man. When you have a correspondence between the word and the image, then you have truth. Truth is when a... Is that smoke? No, I'm just kidding. Can't do this in California. People actually lose their minds. <laughs> what did you do when I said that? You turned around to look. Since there's not smoke in the back, my statement was false. If there were, my statement would have been true. Truth is when a belief matches up with reality. In fact, Aristotle said truth is telling it like it is, actually describing reality. Now, my guess is some of you might be sitting there going, you know what, I'm not sure I remember from philosophy 101 the definition corresponds theory of truth, but Sean, this seems pretty obvious, and it should be, it is. Everybody lives their lives based on this kind of truth. It's inescapable. If you went home and said, hey, who spoke tonight? You said to a friend, yeah, Barack Obama spoke tonight on truth. You would know that that's false because it doesn't match up with reality. The Bible doesn't define truth this way, but it assumes it. You can't turn to a passage in the Bible that says, here's the definition of truth, but the Bible assumes that our words and our ideas actually can and should describe reality. So what's the ninth commandment, by the way? Oh, you're like, don't quiz me. I'm here to observe. <laughs> Good job. Don't bear false witness or don't lie. What's a lie? An intentional misrepresentation of the truth. So you can't have a lie without truth. The Bible assumes when it talks about the Exodus, there really was a historical Exodus. So the Bible doesn't define truth this way, but it assumes when it comes to religion and spirituality that we're talking about the objective real world. Now, interestingly enough, everybody will agree with the definition of truth that we've given. But when the topic shifts to moral values and sometimes to religion, people will change what they mean by truth. Let me say that again. Everybody lives their lives based upon the correspondence theory of truth. But when it shifts to morals or ethics, and sometimes religion, people will change, whether they realize it or not, what they actually mean by truth. So let me ask you a question. You can just literally shout it out. What do you think is the best flavor of ice cream? Chocolate? I heard cookies and cream, Rocky Road, sherbet, sorry, not an ice cream. You guys are not very opinionated about ice cream. <laughs> Cookie dough. Okay, all right. Tell you what. I'll save you the time. I have not heard the correct answer about the best flavor of ice cream. The best flavor of ice cream is... Oh, you got really quiet. You actually want to know. The best flavor of ice cream is chocolate peanut butter. Now, 
By a show of hands, how many say that's true? Let me see your hands. How many say that's not true, that's false? Okay, time out. <laughs> how can the claim chocolate peanut butter ice cream is the best be true for me, but not true for most of you? And the answer is we're talking about something we call subjective. Subjective claims are personal and they're private, and they depend upon the beliefs of the individual. In fact, what's the key word within subjective? Subject, the person. So the basis of truth, so to speak, is the internal feelings or preferences of the subject. That's what we mean when we talk about subjective. So when you think of subjective claims, I want you to think of ice cream, because ice cream preference really is relative to the individual. What if I were to say this, though? What if I were to say chocolate peanut butter ice cream controls diabetes? Usually I get an amen. I thought there were more Baptists here. <laughs> now that's, some of you actually could hear a little mumbling like that made you nervous. That's a different kind of claim, isn't it? Chocolate peanut butter ice cream is the best. It's a subjective claim. When I say chocolate peanut ice cream controls diabetes, now we're talking about a claim about the real world, aren't we? This is a claim we call objective. These are claims about the mind-independent world. And you might say, these claims are not about the subject, they're about what? The object. Good. So maybe this would help. If I had a big scoop of ice cream here and I said, this is delicious, is that really about the ice cream or is it about my experience of the ice cream? My experience, right? It's my preferences. If I said, this is 30 grams, what's that about? That's about the object, the ice cream. So when you think of objective claims, I want you to think of insulin because insulin actually helps control diabetes. Now, I'm going to ask you nice folks to participate here with me in a minute by shouting out as loud as you can or want to one of two things. If I put a subjective claim up on the screen, I want, screen, I want you to shout out ice cream. If I put an objective claim up on the screen, I'm going to ask you to shout out insulin. That's it. Now, very importantly, I'm not asking you if these claims are true or if they're false. I'm simply asking, what kind of claim are they? Subjective claim, shout out. Objective claim, shout out. All right, you got it. Here we go. Coke tastes better than Pepsi. Okay, good. Even if you don't like Coke or Pepsi, and you're like, I'd rather have coffee or tea, you know that is still a preference claim. That's a subjective claim. How about this one? Diet Coke has fewer calories than regular Coke. Okay, insulin, good. Now we're talking about the soda itself and a property it has, or at least allegedly has. Now we're talking about the object. Okay, good. Ice cream or insulin, two plus two equals four. Okay, good. I'm not sure I've had a single person shout out ice cream for math. Although they're trying to change it in my state once again, but I digress. If there's anything that we know deals with the objective, mind-independent world, it's math. So you're right. Ice cream or insulin, Hawaii is the most beautiful vacation spot on earth. Ice cream, okay, good. We all know it's Southern California. By the way, I don't have this up there, but if I wrote a rose is beautiful, I think that's insulin. I think if you don't think a rose is beautiful, you are just as mistaken as if you think two plus two equals five. I'm dead serious. Beauty is objective in the world because God is beautiful. He's built into his character, but I digress. Ice cream or insulin? George Washington was the first president of the United States. Insulin, insulin. okay, good. Now what discipline are we talking about with this? History, okay, good. So you can't see this the way you could allegedly see smoke in the back or two plus two equaling four, but you still know things in the past 
deal with a mind-independent objective reality. All right, ice cream or insulin, action movies are more enjoyable than romances. Ice cream, okay, good. There's usually at least one young guy who's willing to die on this hill. I've been married 24 years, and let me tell you, it's not worth it. <laughs> Ice cream or insulin? Sean McDowell can bench press 300 pounds. Oh, I heard mixed on that one. Who says ice cream? Who says insulin? Who says after the 2020 elections, I will never vote again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's tempting, but don't give in. Now, do you know the answer to how many pounds I can bench press? No. You might think you do, but you don't know. Now, remember, I'm not asking you if this is true or false. I'm simply asking you, what kind of claim is this? Is this a preference claim that can be true for you but not true for you? Or is there an objective truth about this claim? There's a truth about it. And your beliefs won't change it. This is not a subjective claim. Don't confuse not knowing if something is true or false with it moving from objective to subjective. There can be a lot of objective claims that we might not be able to know if it's true or false. For example, if I said Abraham Lincoln spit in a puddle on a certain year, we could probably never know if that's true or false, but either it's true or false. Our beliefs don't change that reality. Or if I said there's 50 quadrillion, zillion, 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 zillion atoms in the universe, that's about the universe. We can never test that, this side of heaven, but that is still a claim about the object. This is about the object. In this case, it happens to be me. Some of you are thinking, okay, I get it, but yeah, can you do it? Here's the deal. I used to care before I turned 40. <laughs> now I just want to stay alive. Ice cream or insulin? Earth is the center of the solar system. Oh, you paused, why? Because it's false, right? Can you have a false insulin claim? Of course, I think all of you got it. If I said two plus two equals five, that's an insulin claim, but it's false. If I said George Washington was the 20th president of the United States, that's about the presidency and George Washington, but it's false. So far you've told me that mathematical claims and historical claims and scientific claims are like insulin. I want everybody to vote on this one, ice cream or insulin, Abortion is wrong. Oh, I got a slow, delayed mumble of both from up here. Now, is that a scientific claim? No, it's not a historical claim. That is a moral claim. Are moral claims all like ice cream, matters of preferences? Or are they more like insulin that deal with the objective real world? Do you understand the question? Now let's imagine for a minute that all moral issues were like ice cream. Could you ever judge anyone for doing anything morally wrong? No. If morality is like ice cream, then calling anything immoral is like when you laughed at me when I said chocolate peanut butter ice cream is objectively the best. So you can, I, I like this kid. We're in this together. Now, look, I had a discussion with a fellow years ago and we were talking about the issue of abortion and he said, if you don't like abortion, don't have one. I said, sorry to point out the obvious, but I can't. I actually think just for the record that sarcasm is a spiritual gift. It's the sixth love language. <laughs> My wife's not convinced, but I'm there. He said, I said, sorry, but I can't. But notice what he said, if you don't like abortion, don't have one. You realize what he did? He moved the question of the morality of abortion to a matter of tastes. Well, if you don't like abortion, don't have one. If you don't like chicken, get the fish. If you don't like coffee, get tea. I said, I got a question for you. Are you against slavery? And he looked at like I'm crazy and he said, of course. I said, well, then if you don't like slavery, don't own a slave. Let me ask you a question. 
Are we against slavery because we don't like it? Or we think it's wrong to own and mistreat and dehumanize somebody based on something secondary like skin color? Friends, if you say morality is like ice cream, you can't judge sexism, racism, genocide, or any other immoral act as being wrong. If morality is like ice cream. See, people will tell you, and I've heard, have, I've had people tell me that they think morality is subjective and it's relative. I never believe them. Why? Well, number one, Romans chapter two tells us even people without the law know the law because it's written where? On their hearts, their consciences. <laughs> We know there's right and wrong. In fact, my dad said to me one time, he goes, son, you know what someone believes about morality? Not by what people say, not by what they do, but by how they want to be treated. (laughs) People break a promise to you, but the moment you break a promise to them, they will cry foul. Frank Turk said, you know someone's views about morality, not by their actions, but by their reactions. I tell my students, I teach full-time at Biola University. but I've taught a high school class, part-time or full-time, 21 years. And recently, I was having this conversation with my students. I said, look, if somebody tells you there's no such thing as right and wrong, cut in front of them in line. <laughs> what are they going to say? <laughs> hey, that's not right. That's not fair. As if there's some moral standard we're all bound to follow. Friends, we know there's right and we know there's wrong. By the way, if morality is subjective, that completely undermines the gospel because there's no reason why Jesus even had to die. A number of years ago, my students, when I was teaching high school full-time, came into me after school. They're like, Mr. McDowell, at the public school about two miles down the road, they had this free-thinking atheist agnostic club meeting and a hundred students showed up to hear about like that there's no God. They're like, what do you want to do about it? I said, what do you guys want to do about it? We came up with the idea that we would host at our church a debate between three of my students at our Christian school, three students from the public school across town, and the students accepted it. So we debated the historical Jesus, intelligent design, evolution, and morality. And one of my students whom I trained got up there and said, we know there's right and wrong. We expect people to keep their promises. And we know justice is real. There's a moral law, and the best explanation is there's a moral law giver, namely God. She sits down. One of their students came up and said, there is no objective moral law. Morality is like ice cream. It's all a matter of preference. You live according to your code. I live according to our code. And you can't judge anybody else who sees the world differently because there's no objective moral law. And he sits down. Fast forward to the closing speech. And the student who just said there's no such thing as subjective moral law walked up to the podium, looked out and noticed there was probably 400 people there. The church was packed, the smaller church, and most of them were Christians. So he goes, you Christians are a bunch of bigots. You're hateful, you're intolerant, you're homophobic. Shame on you. Repeats himself and he sits down. Do you notice anything ironic? I wanted to walk up, I couldn't, and say, I'd like to announce that my debate partner just forfeited the debate because one minute ago they said there is no objective moral law but then spent their closing speech raging again against christians for being immoral and violating every objective moral law i rest my case why did they respond that way their worldview pushed the objectivity of morality down like a beach ball but it popped up because even people who don't believe in god are still made in the image of the God that they reject. And they still live in the world that God has made. By the way, what is the question about abortion really quickly? Think about it this way. Imagine tonight some of you go home and you decide to do the dishes. Now, for some of you, this is going to take a lot of imagination. You're doing the dishes and a younger, uh, maybe younger brother or sister or child or grandchild comes walking behind you can't see and says hey mommy daddy papa can i kill this now before you say yes or no what question would you ask 
What is it? What is it? If you turn around to roach, you'd be like, yes, hurry up. Turn around to a little puppy, you'd be like, no, that's messed up. Why do you want to hurt a puppy? If you turn around, the kid's like, hey, I pulled this infant out of a carriage down the street. Can I kill this? You'd be like, no. And even though you're five, you need serious counseling. Now, why should we treat a roach differently than we treat a human being? And the answer is because of what it is. How we treat something should be based upon what it is. That's why the Nazis, when they tried to exterminate the Jews in the Holocaust, dehumanized them and called them vermin because we treat vermin differently than we treat human beings. Look, either the unborn is human or it's not. Either we protect the most vulnerable humans amongst us or we don't. There is a truth about this question of abortion. Even though people differ on it, either the unborn is human or not, either we are bound to care for the most vulnerable amongst us or we're not. I think all of us know when we reflect upon it that there's subjective right and there's subjective wrong. It's written on our hearts. Ice cream or insulin, I'm gonna give you three more. Jesus was a carpenter. Insulin, good. Jesus died on the cross in 8030. Good. Some argue 33, but it's still an insulin claim. Jesus resurrected as proof he is divine. Insulin, okay, good. Now that's a historical claim with theological implications. That Jesus rose from the grave, and this is confirmation and proof that he's actually God in human flesh. Now let's take a step back and clarify so we're on the same page with this. I hope all of you realize that nobody dies and goes to hell just because they don't believe in Jesus. You realize that, right? Nobody dies and goes to hell just because they don't believe in Jesus. People die and go to hell because of a rebellion against their creator, because of a moral virus the Bible calls sin. And to say that Buddha or Krishna or any other religious figure can pay for my sins is like saying chocolate peanut butter ice cream controls diabetes. It doesn't work in the objective real world. Now, why is this important? Two of the biggest virtues preached to this generation are diversity and inclusiveness. And yet Jesus comes along and says, I am the only way to get to God. That sounds kind of exclusive. In an age of inclusiveness, how can you say Jesus is the only way? Well, there's a somewhat simple answer to this. Jesus is the only way to God because Jesus is the only one who fixed the problem that separates us from God. The problem is sin. And Jesus lived a sinless life life and paid the price for us we couldn't pay ourselves look if your car runs out of gas it doesn't do any good to rotate the tires it doesn't do any good to get new spark plugs or spend four grand on a new transmission or plug it in with an ev and try to give it power if it's out of gas you got to identify the problem and fix the problem accordingly the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Because of sin, we have been corrupted and are in rebellion against our creator. That's the root of the problem. Every worldview identifies something wrong with the world. Marxists would say it's capitalism that creates haves and have-nots, which places the problem out there. New Agers would say the problem is we haven't tapped into our inner divinity and released the godness inside of us, so to speak. Buddhists would say the problem is we have wants and desires create suffering. So if you follow the Eightfold Path and purge myself of my desires, then we could fix things. Jesus said the root of the issue is sin. There is an objective moral law built into God's own character and sin separates us from a holy god and jesus is the only way 
because he's the only one who fixed the problem that separates us from God. But what makes Christianity different is it's not the kind of belief system that can be true for you, but not true for me. I mean, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. In other words, all of Christianity rests upon the historical resurrection. I interviewed on my YouTube channel a former, or he still is, an existing progressive Christian, former evangelical, and I said, in your church, do you preach that the resurrection is required or is it a metaphor? He said, some years it's required, some years it's more metaphorical, and I thought in his mind, the historical resurrection is a secondary doctrine we can agree to disagree on. I think Paul was very clear that without the historical resurrection, Christianity is worthless, and we're still in our sins, and we're to be pitied, and we're lying. Christianity is rooted in a testable single historical event, the resurrection of Jesus. But what's amazing about this, if you were there at the empty tomb, you could have seen a ton and a half stone rolled aside, ducked down, reached inside, smelled the scent of an empty tomb, and seen the linen cloth of Jesus laying there. If you're there with Thompson said, I will not believe unless I can see and touch the spear wounds in his side and the nail marks in his hand, you could have reached out and touched the spear wounds in the side of Jesus. If you're there at the cross, you could have reached out and touched the cross and felt the trickle of warm blood coming down it. In fact, maybe even gotten a splinter from the cross itself. You might believe in Jesus, you might not believe in Jesus, but the claims of Christ are not the kind of claims that can be true for you, but not true for me. They are true or they are false, and we believe them or we don't. Now, maybe you've heard somebody say something like, well, there is no truth. Clearly, if there is no truth, then Jesus can't be the truth. Now, hopefully you recognize an obvious problem with this. If someone says to you there is no truth, ask them a very simple question. Is that true? If they say no, then say, I'm confused why I should believe something if you don't think it's true. If they say yes, then somebody say, okay, so it's true that there's no truth. I'm a little bit confused. I don't know that I've directly had somebody say to me, there is no truth, but I've had people say things like that, well, say such things as, well, you shouldn't judge. My question is, is that your judgment? <laughs> They're gonna have to say yes then if, why is it that you get to judge and I don't? I'm a little bit confused. Or maybe you've had somebody say, you shouldn't force your morals upon somebody else. My question is, is that your morality? Yes. Then if we shouldn't force our morals on others, and that's your morality, then why are you forcing your morals upon me? We know there's such a thing as truth. It's written on our hearts, and we know that it's important. Maybe you heard this one, sincerity is more important than truth. Now, there's an obvious response to this one, is that people can be sincerely what? Wrong. And ironically, you can be insincerely right. <laughs> you can be sincerely wrong, sincerely, wait, I gotta get this right. Sincerely wrong and sincerely right, insincerely wrong and insincerely right. Sincerity has nothing to do with whether something is true or false. How about this one? Isn't it arrogant to think that you are right? I was having a conversation with a fellow, former Ivy League professor, and he goes, wow, Sean, you really think Christianity is true? That is arrogant. And as best I can remember, I stopped and I said, if I've been arrogant, I apologize. Humility is a Christian virtue, right? In our best moments, if we've been arrogant, we should own it. Not that I always do that, but that's a good Christian response if we can. My response is I'm a little bit confused. We shifted from debating an issue. Now we're debating my character, whether I'm arrogant or not. This is called an ad hominem. What does my alleged arrogance have to do with whether I'm right or I'm wrong? 
It's an ad hominem attack. You can be arrogant and right, you can be arrogant and wrong. You can be humble and right, you can be humble and wrong. Now, is there a connection between humility and knowing truth? Yeah. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But this attacks the person rather than the issue. And how about this one we hear, but it feels true to me. That's where we've shifted as a culture. In many ways, we've shifted from truth is something we discover outside and conform our lives to, to truth is something we look within and affirm internally. As we've had this shift over the last 10, 15, 20 years, where now my identity is rooted in how I feel, I don't think it's coincidence that we have seen mental illness and anxiety and depression increase at the same time. Our feelings are not meant to ground our own identity. It's knowing truth that sets us free. You live your life based solely upon how you feel as good and beautiful, as important as feelings are, and you will wreck your life. The last one you may have heard is that all religions are true. About 50% of Gen Zers or so, and this is really true for all generations, would say, well, Jesus is my savior, Jesus is my truth, but others might have a different truth, might have another way to get to God. Can all religions really be true? By the way, when someone says all religions are really true, I think they've shifted the conversation about religion not to really what is objectively true, but they're looking at religion in terms of religion just helps people cope, gives them community, and gives them meaning. That's the lens through which when somebody says all religions are true, I think they're approaching it without even realizing it. But can all religions be true? I'm going to put a simple chart up here. This might be helpful to you. I'll leave it up for a minute. I took the top five religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and just listed their view of God, salvation, and other religions. Buddhists, there is no personal God. Hindus, many gods. Some would say 330 million gods. Others would say, well, it's one God, but many forms. Jews, one God, Yahweh. Muslims, one God, Allah. Christians, one God who exists eternally as three persons. Now, can all those be false? Sure. Can they all be true? No. All religions could be false but they can't possibly all be true. All religions could be false, but they can't possibly all be true. Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm one of the ways, one of the truths, and one life. He said, if it feels good, do it. That is not what Jesus said. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by now, what we haven't done is walk through how we show and we demonstrate that Christianity is true. I'm convinced that it's two things. We need a better, stronger, more compelling apologetic and defense of the Christian faith than ever before, especially in our age of misinformation. But we also need to be what I call agents of grace in people's lives, in our cancel culture which is worldwide now, which says, if you make a mistake, we're going to cancel you. You know what cancel culture lacks? Grace and forgiveness. That's at the root of Christianity, is that you don't earn salvation. It's a gift of grace. In our age, friends, we need truth, and we can't compromise it. But we need love and grace so the world can see something different in our lives. And I know that's exactly what Tim Tebow was talking about this afternoon. Jesus came in grace and he came in truth. The reality is we have a broken world today and it's relationships that many times gives us the opportunity to speak truth into people's lives. You know what's fascinating about Christianity is God has communicated with us in many different ways, hasn't he? Through creation, through conscience, prophets, angels, the Bible, but the ultimate revelation of God is in the person of Jesus himself. God's ultimate communication 
is relational. That's why in his letter to 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, we not only gave you the gospel, but we gave you our very own lives. If you want to be an ambassador for Christ today and make a difference, don't compromise truth. It's the truth that brings freedom. But lean in with love and graciousness and kindness in our broken, hurting, cancel culture. That gets many people's attention. And so we can speak truth into their lives. Amen? If it's helpful to you, I try to model this all the time. I just had an atheist on earlier this week. We had a civil conversation. I really want to mentor and model people how in our cancel culture, you can have conversations across differences. Imagine if people thought this thought. Their lives were broken and their next thought was, I just need to find a Christian because a Christian will listen to me and love me. Can you imagine that? What if we were actually known for our love? Which is what the scripture says. I'm not gonna pretend that I have this figured out and I'm the model of doing it, but I can tell you this is something I'm leaning in and trying to do and encouraging others to do. So if you are on YouTube, one thing I try to do is just model these kinds of conversations regularly. That's one way you can track. Each week I'm putting up apologetic videos I just interviewed somebody on near-death experiences. I haven't posted it yet. Absolutely brilliant, the evidence for life after death from near-death experiences. There's evidence coming out for the Bible regularly, but also having a lot of conversations with people who see the world differently. Friends, we can do this. It's not that hard. Hopefully that would be a tool that would help you out. I'm going to sneak to the back. Would love to say hi, answer a question, shake your hand, sign a book if that's helpful. But thanks so much for allowing me to share tonight. God bless.